Well, Patty, thanks for uh, coming on the Prolific Writer Podcast. Uh, really privileged to have you on the on the show. And Patty and I uh, are in the same writing group. And I think I remember seeing maybe a couple weeks ago, Patty, you just finished your hundredth story. Is that correct? I just published my hundredth title in a unique title. Yeah, that's pretty exciting. <laughs> that's amazing. And w- what I love about that is, um, and this is not to offend you, Patty, by any means, um, but you know, Patty's not Stephen King, and you probably have never heard her name. Um, but there's so many writers out there that have written so many stories and written so many books and are, are making a great living and successful and people love their stories and, that you'll never hear of. And so I've, I've just really, um, my greatest accomplish or I shouldn't say accomplishment, comment um, or encouragement is people that say, hey, I just found this new author and uh, I didn't realize they had so much stuff out there. And so that's what I hope happens through this show, too, is that many people can discover great books. So thanks, Patty, for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. So, Patty, you are in Canada, I think I heard. I am. And what part of Canada are you from? I'm in Prince Edward Island, the home of Anne of Green Gables. Well, very cool. That's one of my my wife's favorite book series. And uh, ironically, she's actually Canadian. Oh, is she? <laughs> yeah, she she grew up in. Um, well, I shouldn't say she grew up. She was born there. Lived a couple years, uh, Cochrane, Ontario. Oh, okay, very central. Yeah, I'm all the way out on the east coast. We're just north of Maine. Okay, yeah, you're on the beautiful part. Um, it's very pretty. Yeah, this time of year, the winter not so much, but this time of year, it's really starting to be attractive. And remind me why I live in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. Yeah, we need those reminders. That's for sure. I'm in the Midwest, so you know when the winter's here, it's like, okay, why am I here again? Uh, oh, yeah. uh, so why don't we go back a little bit, Patty? Because you obviously have an origin story, and you've come from somewhere. Um, talk a little bit about. Are you originally from Canada? Talk a little about your family, kind of what they did for a living, where where you started. Yeah, no, born and raised here. Tried to leave here a bunch of times, and never worked out. Um, my dad was. Uh, um, frustrated writer, which I didn't realize until much later on, uh, actually after he had passed away. Um, but he and he was a, a hands-on, you know, blue-collar worker. My mom was the same. She grew up on a farm. Uh, they're, they're both very creative people. My mom is still very creative, uh, but neither one of them really showed any aptitude for writing that I saw as a child. Um, and my my two older sisters are both entrepreneurs as well, so it's kind of uh, it kind of runs in the family. Um, my yeah, my dad brought home Dungeons and Dragons when I was nine. <laughs> he was way more excited about it than we were, and he was our dungeon master for probably five years. And all of the kids in the neighborhood would come to our house and play D and D all weekend, Friday night till Sunday. Mom would kick them out for Sunday dinner. And so really that's the origin of my passion for what I do. I grew up on Lord of the Rings and Isaac Asimov and Ian McCaffrey and David Eddings and you name it. I was reading books that really a six, seven, eight year old child shouldn't read, but I didn't know that. Right? So I didn't find kids books until I was a teenager. That's really interesting. I, I talked to so many people that Dungeons and Dragons is part of their story. And, and I think it's just that, that, natural storytelling i mean that immersing yourself in this world and this other world and you know thinking about strategy and all that it just seems like sometimes that just fits together yeah um, absolutely. i mean i never was into dungeons and dragons but i you know it sounds like you really can't be uh neutral you're, you're either like full on <laughs> or you know parties in the basement or nothing yeah it's pretty it's such an immersive lifestyle really and i mean it, i I credit D&D in a lot of ways for teaching me how to be a storyteller because when my dad stopped uh, being Dungeon Master, I took it up. And so, you know, I'm writing a dungeon a week because we're getting together on the weekend and my peeps want to play, you know. Um, and I, they were never elaborate or anything like that, but there was always a world-building um, and storytelling element to it that went beyond crush them, mush them, beat them to a pulp <laughs> because, you know, you didn't want them to get bored. So um, that kind of pushed me into uh, writing a bit of fan fiction here and there. Um, but it wasn't long before I was writing my own stuff because I um, I was driven to by telling stories through Dungeons and Dragons. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, growing up, you know, we got Dungeons and Dragons in the basement. Dad brings it home. Um, yeah. Were there 
books around the house? Were there a lot of stories being told from your mother, your father as you were growing up? Yeah, not so much my mom. My mom was more of a romance novel reader. Okay. <laughs> the story, which there's nothing wrong with that. But um, she was all about consuming the story and move on, whereas my dad was about the immersive world. Mm. And so um, I, I, I don't know how many times I've read the Bulgaria from David Eddings and the Malorian. Uh, those 10 books over and over, even as an adult now, probably every couple of years I'll read them through because they, they had, it's, it's about going away to another place, right, and, and being immersed in that. And so, my, yeah, my dad had a library, and yeah, we had TV, and we watched Star Trek, and you know, we're into that, but um, books, were, books were it, books were the place to go, and I, I would help myself. Dad never, and Mom never told me not, I couldn't read something. So um, I think he read me the Lord, I read uh, the Hobbit when I was six. He was reading it to my sisters, and you know the nightmares from the spiders and <laughs> and the dragons and you know. But I loved it, and and so I yeah I was reading a lot of things with the dark over novels, but I probably shouldn't have been reading it then. <laughs> but uh, um, it was I'm I'm glad that I did because it certainly expanded my brain. So that by the time I found. Um, and Nancy Drew and Trixie Belden and at 12, 13 years old, um, I, they were so, the storylines were so simplistic to me that my brain said to me, I read my first Nancy Drew novel, my brain said to me as I finished it two hours later, you can do this, you can do this. You might not be able to do Asimov, but you can do Nancy Drew. I was like, oh, how interesting. And so I decided to be a writer at mm -hmm. 12 years old. <laughs> So that, that was kind of the, the moment. It was the oh, reading yeah. a story. I mean, it's funny. I hear you know people when I interview them, they'll say, or they'll read a really bad book and they'll say, I can do better than that, you know, um, which, you know, at the moment, you're, it's not really true. But, but you know, you no. at least think, hey, if, if somebody had to write these and put these words together, I, I think I could, you know, I could tell a story. Yeah. Um, so what was kind of the progression from there? So, you know, you got Dungeons and Dragons in the basement. You got... Yeah dark stories floating around you got romance going around you got um age 12 i'm gonna i'm gonna be a writer what what was kind of the path after that uh it was a mess um i wrote obviously bad fan fiction um based on fantasy for probably 10 years um wrote my first book by the time i was 16 though no, that was really that was a huge accomplishment for me or at least i thought it was at the time and actually when i look back at the writing that i did then it wasn't awful it wasn't great but it you know the story storytelling elements were there which was really um encouraging i think the spark can't be taught the ta the skills can but that that need to write can't be so mm -hmm. um i think for writers that have that for here that who hear the voices and have that spark um the storytelling is innate it's it it's kind of built in so um i yeah wrote all through high school uh went to university was encouraged to be to do uh education because there was no um future in being a writer so history and english major i was going to be a professor um and i really my soul was being crushed in university i found i was being taught to be a a critic not a writer how to criticize and tear apart work rather than build it. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was planning to leave. I was going to go do broadcast journalism. And um, uh, I took a journalism degree. And I loved that part of it. Um, I loved the, the fast pace and the understanding the core of the story. And um, I think I, I really learned how to outline and build uh, stories very precisely in journalism school. And I, and I really, really loved that part. Um, that encouraged me that I thought, you know what, I can write for a living, I could do this, but I really didn't like telling the truth <laughs> mm -hmm. or other people's truths. I really wanted to, to write um, outside of that. But again, there's no, there's no future in being a novelist. Uh, and I tried a few times to find an agent down that road along that path and it, it crashed and burned. Mm -hmm. um, I just wasn't ready. So uh, I was getting ready to leave the island for the first time, uh, and I met my husband, who obviously wasn't my husband at the time, and he was in university, and he was here, and I thought, oh, maybe I'll stick around a little bit longer, and so fell into crap jobs, um, decided I didn't want to be a journalist, and 
the bottom tier, you're chasing ambulances and fire trucks, and it's really, um, it's not very soul fulfilling unless you're that kind of person, which I wasn't. So uh, along the way, I'm I'm looking, trying to get agents. Live it, you know, it's all about that dream. You know, the get the perfect agent, write the best seller, make the million bucks, live in a cabin in the woods. And, you know, come out occasionally and do book signings and that's it. And obviously we know that that's fallacy, but at the time that was what was in my head. And I ended up um, uh, taking hairdressing and was a hairstylist for 15 years, owned my own successful hair salon uh, because it was created and it was a need to create something um, but it wasn't the right thing. And so I was, I thought that university was soul crushing but actually hairdressing was literally soul crushing it was destroying my soul um to the point where i was actually suffering depression Mm. which a lot of creatives go through you know when we're not able to do the thing that we really love and so i i fell into screenwriting it was totally by accident i was doing improv at the time i was in an all-female improv troupe for five years and loved every second of it but if everything that i did didn't quite feel exactly right and so the the screenwriting was so close, uh, and it was at a point in my life where I was ready to dump everything and just do that, um, to the point where this was time number two, my husband and I were going to leave the island. Um, I actually was told, I did a screenwriting boot camp, and I took a project with me, and I was told by the, the mentor, you need to move to Toronto, Ontario, and write for television. I was like, oh my God, fun, somebody's telling me I need to write for a living, this is awesome. And screenwriting was, and is, a a passion of mine. Um, However, I would have had to write for someone else. Um, And so, uh, around that time, my niece handed me Harry Potter and Twilight and said, Aunt Patty, you need to read these. She was young at the time, and I was like, oh, these are kids' books. I was still focused on the fantasy, science fiction, whatever. And there was something in them that just woke up this, the voices again and said, listen, you need to try this one more time. And so before we packed up our lives and left, I said, honey, I'm just going to try. I'm going to try the book thing one more time. He's like, sure, whatever you want to do. He's very supportive of mine. I, I know I'm very fortunate that way. Uh, so I, I'm a huge believer in the universe. And so I said, okay, universe, you want me to write books? You want me to be a writer for a living? Tell me what you want me to do. And literally... That night, well, 2.30 in the morning, I was woken up with a voice in my head that said, you need to get out of bed. And so I get up, I went to my office, and the voice said, you got to write this down. My mom's a witch, my dad's a demon, and I want to be ordinary. And I think it was three weeks later, 94,000 words later, I had the first book in a new series written. And it was great. And the people I was letting read it thought it was great and they started sending it out to agents and they thought it was great and they were asking for fulls and I was getting you know but I was also getting oh you know this is saturated or that's it and I was like I don't care this is the first time I'm getting you're ready and so uh that's that's how I end and I I came home from my job my job my business one day not long after that and I said to my husband, I'm done. I I have to try this. I'm going to sell this lawn and rifle time. No prospects, no publisher, no agent, nothing. Right? And my husband's like, okay. <laughs> so six months later, I sold my business. January 1st, 2010, I started writing full time. And that was it. I had enough back. Wow, that's amazing. That's the journey, yeah. But you know, it's, it's interesting if you really listen to your, I mean, you have obviously know your own story better than I do, but I, I just hear this thread because I hear you know, 12 years old, I want to write, um, mm-hmm. journalism, you know, sc- screenwriting, um, you're, you're, you're still kind of writing these stories. It's still there. It, it didn't go away. And you just knew at some point, obviously, you know, that moment at the middle of the night that, you know, I think this is what I need to do. And, yeah. um, you know, so, it, so talk a little bit about, um, you know, obviously you're giving kind of broad strokes um, of your story but you know were you still writing stories even in the during the hairdressing days and and hating life and I mean were you actually writing anything or were you just kind of thinking about stuff or talk a little bit about that yeah I wasn't when I was hairdressing I was 
Um, for a long, for a long time, I was in darkness. I wasn't creating. I felt crappy, really crappy. And I think it's um, a very sad truth too about um, the creative industry that we we let ourselves get shut off. And so I I stumbled on improv. And improv started a chain reaction because I was creating again. Um, I ended up in an improv soap opera where I was playing conjoined twins that had recently recently been separated, and one side of me had one arm and one side had the other. It was it was awesome, and, but it stirred up this giant storytelling uh, thing for me. And I went to one of my cast members or my castmates and said, "We need to do a television show." And she was like, "Okay." And she didn't pursue it, but I did. And so I wrote my first screenplay with no idea what I was doing, but I didn't care because I was writing. And so it was that trigger. And so I find that, um, I found that there was, with enough, I'm sorry, my pugs are snoring. <laughs> People are getting over there. No, so we're ready. <laughs> they insist on sitting next to me. Um, the, the, without the trigger, though, without the willingness to say yes to it, um, I, I was, yeah, there was nothing. It was awful. And I think that's why um, when it happened, when I started writing, I think that's why I'm so prolific, because it was almost like there was all this time between 12 and 38 where I just, I needed it and it couldn't come out. And mm. now all of a sudden it is. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's interesting. I talked to Amanda Lee. I don't know if you know Amanda, but um, she she's written like a bazillion novels, and uh, and her background is journalism. And yeah. she she says a little bit about you know I was I was kind of looking at your thread and and just you know the journalism how to outline a, a story, how to kind of get the meat at it. And he, she said you know that really helped her too yeah. to write prolifically. I mean she writes two novels a month and she's crazy, but. Um, but, you know, she didn't realize that until she actually started doing it full time and said, yeah, that's actually been kind of a gift. And then, like you said, uh, screenplay, you know, it's how do you write succinctly? How do you, you know, all those little tools are obviously being used in you cr creating a lot of work. And and so, not you know, despite having some desert years, you know, and some years, yeah. years of, you know, bleaching and cutting hair or whatever, yeah. um, you know, th some of those those experiences actually have been been really valuable to you. It's super valuable. I, I really think that I wasn't ready and I needed those experiences. And I certainly, you know, I, I have said, I've had some bumps along the road and I've had people say, you know, do you have any regret regrets? I'm like, no, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. I get to do what I love every single day. I wouldn't have appreciated it at 21. I wouldn't have appreciated it at 31. Right. Um, and without, without being without being told that writing fast was necessary too, I don't know that I would have been okay with it. I didn't even realize there was a controversy about writing fast <laughs> until like a year and a half in. And then I started having people say, Oh, you write too fast. I'm like, what does that mean? I don't even know what that means mm -hmm. because in journalism, if you don't write fast, your managing editor is on your butt. I mean, you're not going to survive. And same in screenwriting. You might be on set and they need, they need script changes and you're the writer. You got to get the mm -hmm. stuff done, right? Or you're, you're writing at night. We just finished a web series, actually, uh, my creative partner and I, uh, and I, I converted everything into novellas to match it and whatever, but, but I love being on set. I miss that side. And so I'm glad that I get a chance to do that, mm -hmm. but you're also standing there talking to the actors, writing their dialogue for them or rewriting their dialogue for them because it's not working for them in that moment. And so the excitement of being able to, I call it the brain dump. Just open my brain and let it out. I can't imagine writing slow. I don't even know what that means. Mm -hmm. And I know everybody has their own speed, and that's okay sure. too. But um, I don't think there's anything wrong with. And I write really, really clean first draft, mm -hmm. which I'm very grateful for. Um, and every time I see somebody talk about writing fast and how it's uh, there's something wrong with it. I always say, you know what, we all have our own path and our own journey, but I credit journalism and screenwriting both. Mm -hmm. I do not credit my English background mm -hmm. at all, because mm -hmm. that's all about, um, especially growing up in Canada, it's all about literary fiction. And again, there's nothing wrong with literary fiction if that's what you write, but don't describe a tree over four pages and, and expect <laughs> me to be excited about it, right? Unless I'm that kind of reader. Mm -hmm. No, and I, I think, for, you know, the history of literature, I mean, I, I think actually writers were 
tend to be more prolific. I mean, they didn't have word processors and yet they had typewriters. And so they had to be very clean, um, you know, or they hand wrote and they had to be very clean. Um, and, and I think that's a myth because I think traditional publishing, you know, I've even heard Stephen King talk about this is, you know, he started a pen name just for that reason. He, he wrote too fast and they said, you can't keep releasing books. It's going to saturate the market. No one's going to buy your books. And he's like, well, I'm going to start another name. And that's when he started the Richard Bachman name. And, um, and a lot of people don't realize that it wasn't just because he felt like he had to write different stuff. It was more just, I got all these stories and you guys keep telling me I'm yeah. only, only going to produce a book every, every year and a half. He's like, that's not fast enough. Yeah. You know, you mentioned, uh, you know, earlier Asimov, I mean, 500 books or more. And, you know, um, yeah. you know, again, I think the, you know, one of the things I'm trying to kind of unearth through this, this show is that writing fast doesn't mean poor quality, you know, writing, mm -hmm. writing fast doesn't mean, um, junk you know and um you, you know and, and i think and again i i would rather have someone err on the prolific get your work out than not than sit on a novel for 10 years you know because that's that, that's yeah. the stories that i hear are really sad is that and even people on the show will talk about that you know i had this book i rewrote it for eight years and and that's one of their biggest regrets because they didn't move on to the next story they, they just kind of kept polishing this thing and tweaking this thing and starting yeah. over and then they never they never shared any of their stories until they finally said forget this i'm just gonna write it and edit it and send it off and see what happens um so 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 let's let's unearth that a little bit let's let's go down that that road a little bit um obviously you didn't really think twice about writing fast or prolifically <laughs> with journalism and and all that um but let's i mean you have 100 stories published mm -hmm. works so um, so let's talk a little bit about, I wanted to talk first about just kind of your genre because you're all over the place as far yeah. as genre goes. Um, that was but, the other thing I've done this, I've done this so wrong. From day <laughs> one. I mean, I, I, all of the, all of the, the advice and everything that I've seen since I got started, it was way too late. I'm in every age group <laughs> from, <laughs> I have a picture book out with a small publisher here. I have middle grade. YA. The bulk of my stuff is YA, but I've moved into adult. I'm writing cozies. I have police par procedural paranormal murder mysteries. I have one lonely no new adult romance because I wanted to test the market, um, which, oh, my God, I'll never write another romance novel ever. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, I'm, I write horror and post-apocalyptic, and, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm everywhere. Mm -hmm. I'm all over the place. But what? right now, I'm, I'm really in the, the joyful, happy, snarky, sarcastic realm. Mm -hmm. So whether it's paranormal or mystery. So, so let's talk about that. So um, as far as choosing a genre, obviously you've, you've done, you know, as you mentioned, mystery, paranormal, romance, sci-fi stuff, apocalyptic stuff. Um, is that, um, uh, you know, you said earlier in your story about, you know, a lot of different influences. Is that just because you've, you've kind of read broadly and you just say, hey, I, I really enjoy all this stuff? Or is there, it's just kind of whatever the muse leads you to? Um, talk a little bit about your process there. Yeah, my husband hates this part because um, uh, I hear voices and he always says, that makes you sound like a crackpot, honey, and I'm like, oh, that's okay. <laughs> uh, it started with Sid, the, that character. And, I mean, it started a lot earlier than that, the, the two main characters of that fantasy book that I wrote when I was 16. Um, I, don't get, I don't get a choice. They tell me what to write, and I write it. I, I really feel like I just, I'm fingers on the keyboard in a lot of cases. And so um, if something strikes me, I I write it. I don't I don't filter or um, very rarely do I, I've only done it twice, actually, uh, research a market and write specifically to that market. Um, the first one was this cozy series um, that I'm writing, and, and I'm having a blast with, so I'm really glad. And the other one was lit RPG, and the reason I, uh, which is literary role playing game for those who don't know the genre yet, it's mm -hmm. it's still fairly young. Um, I love, like I said, D and D, and so I had no idea lit RPG was a genre. I'm like, oh, that's so exciting! I'm gonna write a fantasy novel. I haven't haven't published a fantasy novel yet, um, but it's very specific tropes and things that you need to hit and whatnot. And so. Um, oh, and the romance novel, that, that one was a, a research-based thing too, but everything else has just been spontaneous and, oh, that's an awesome voice, and I have to be really careful because I can sit down. I had a guy challenge me actually at dinner not too long ago. He said, oh, you can't come up with story ideas just like that. I was like, give me a piece of paper. 
And I sat there for six minutes and I looked around. It had to be based on the environment. I looked around. I wrote out six series ideas and handed it to him. He's like, I'm like, I can't shut it off. You know, it's just, it's one of those things. It's a muscle. Once it gets going, it just, and that's dangerous because then how do you decide what to work on? Right. Uh, but, uh -huh. <laughs> but that's, yeah, that's where it comes from. It's not, if I had to actually decide, I think I'd be, I'd feel stuck because I wouldn't be like, yeah. Whereas one voice is louder than the other. So that's the one that gets the attention. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, I think it's, you know, it's one thing I love about the show is that the people I interview, they, they all say different things about that. And, you know, some are, I just had Chris Fox on, you know, and he's, he's like, Hey, you, yeah. you know, you research, you do your market, you know, you write what you love, that kind of thing. Um, but others say no way. Um, they they write whatever the muse tells them to and the voices tell them to. And, and, you know, I'm a little that way too. And, um, and I, th I think what's what's freeing is that in the indie space is that we can do that and we, yeah. we don't have to, you know, um, you know, I heard Lee Child talk about this recently of, of how, you know, the Jack Reacher novels, it's like, he's just like, well, why am I going to stop? He hasn't written anything else. I mean, he's written 20 of those and, and they sell obviously millions of copies, but, but you wonder, you know, how much pressure is that from the publisher? How much is, well, that this makes my living and does he have, does he have other story ideas? Maybe he doesn't. Um, but um, but you know, there's there's something freeing to have to be able to explore different voices and and different genres, and you know, and and I think there's also a misnomer that when you sit down to write a book, I don't think people realize this is a lot of times people don't just say, "I'm going to sit down and write a sci-fi book," they just start telling a story, and it happens to be in a setting of sci-fi or space or wherever. Um, you know, Stephen King is uh, you, I like Stephen King as you can tell, but yeah. but but he's he's talked about that. He says honestly, I don't sit down and say I'm going to write a horror novel. I just put characters in a room and they start talking and they start doing things, and yeah. I just let them go where they need to go. And yeah. if, it, if it becomes a a slasher suspense or it becomes <laughs> you know Green Mile, that's just what it's going to be, yeah. you know. And so um, I think there's something to that, like like you were saying about story, how you learn how to tell stories. Mm -hmm. That's that's what matters. It's the interesting characters because because here's the thing like when you tell a story if it's in in you know today in canada or it's in space it's it's still the same story it's just a different setting i mean they're still talking they're still interacting they still have problems they still right i mean it's it, there might be different tropes there might be different whatever but but the reality is like our stories they're just the same stories just told over and over in just different ways with different characters and different settings i mean that's yeah. i think that's what people forget yeah, absolutely. And I really think the, it's people get so hung up on setting and plot. And I mean, yes, important. Absolutely. But to me, it's the emotional impact that I make on my reader that keeps them coming back over and over and over and over and over again. Right. Um, the fact that regardless of what's going on, where they are, if they're swinging a sword, if they're firing a phaser, if they're lost in the wild west, if they're whatever, uh, they it's it's connecting with their emotional journey um, while they're trying to get from A to B, solve this problem or, you know, create this solution or whatever. So, yeah, it should, you should be able to, you should be able to pick up a genre that isn't necessarily your favorite genre and still connect with a character if the book's written mm -hmm. properly. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, you know, that's the advice, you know, write what you know, but I mean, do, do people <laughs> really know about, disagree. yeah, I mean, I don't know how to swing a sword. I don't know how to fly a spaceship. I mean, it's like, well, then my books are gonna be really boring. You know, like I know how to change a diaper. You know, I've been married for a while. Like, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, I'm not that handy. So I don't know what I'm going to write about. You know, it's gonna be the most boring novel you've ever read. Um, but you know, you imagine yourself doing those things or, or what have you. Um, well, let, let's dig a little further. Cause I always find this an interesting question. Now you've talked about, you know, your muse and writing all over the place and all that. Um, but obviously you've written a lot of stories. So how do you determine you personally, how do you determine kind of what's next? I mean, like, what's the next project? You know, is it just what I'm excited about? Is it not really matter? Yeah. How, how do you kind of determine like next in the series? Cause you have a lot of series and a lot of different genres. So talk a little bit about that process. So it used to be whatever I felt like. Um, but then the, the readers, got involved <laughs> and their demands became a part of the process right not demands i shouldn't say it that way but their their wants and desires became part of my process and so um 
uh, I would is there. I would start testing things. So I would write the first book in a series, and if they liked it, great. I would write the second one. And if they liked it, great. Um, as long as that voice kept talking to me. Um, so, but that that does lead you down a rocky road because right now I'm at number forty three in a universe um, that the readers love. Uh, however there's really only a couple of entry points for that series. And so from a writer's perspective, it's awesome because I really love the characters and I know them really well. And it's that very first book that, that called to me. And so, um, in fact, I just finished outlining a novella for an anthology that's based on those characters. Um, however, from a businesswoman's standpoint as an entrepreneur, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to stay in that universe as often because uh, from a marketing perspective, it's much more difficult um, to sell a series of 43 books. <laughs> um, so um, exploring other things is, so I have to, I have to create a balance. Um, and normally what I'm doing is I'm writing one or two, sometimes three books in a series, publishing those. I tend to write long series. I have a few trilogies, one quadrilogy, um, but right now I'm working on a, a 13 book series. Um, I have a 20 book series waiting. Um, I have another 13 book series, wait, you know what I mean? So there's, there's these, these prolonged series. So I create, I'll create two or three in that series to give the readers something to, to devour. And then I'll move on to another series and I'll write two or three in that and I'll give them that. Um, and then if there's another series that's, that's still unwinding, I'll give them one, et cetera. So I try to balance it out so that there's a constant flow from each world. Um, but again, it's, a, it's when you write fast and you write a lot from the marketing side of it, it's a real struggle to, to um, make sure that everything you're creating is getting uh, um, the benefit of your attention, and yeah. it doesn't. It doesn't always. There's stuff that falls through the cracks. For me, I would rather the marketing fell through the cracks than my my the quality of my product. Mm -hmm. And so, it's always it's always the marketing side. I'll just drop a book and move on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's very cool. I I need I need someone to save me actually when it comes to that side of it mm -hmm. because I. Um, I, I too, I came from the, the beginnings of it, you know, I started publishing in 2011. And so I came from that beautiful, shiny, uh, KDP was brand new moment where you put up one book for free and you're set. Right. Uh -huh. And as long as you write, rinse, repeat, uh, -huh. uh and keep publishing, you're going to make lots of money. And it doesn't work that way anymore. At least I don't think it works the way it used to. Um, and so there's the, you know, AMS ads and Facebook ads and, mm -hmm. you know, the, the branding presence and all that stuff to balance while you're trying to write. So mm -hmm. it's tough. I don't know how people who aren't doing full-time ads are actually mm -hmm. better than me, some of them. <laughs> yeah, I, I think there's a, I mean, people listening, they, I, I know we have a lot of people that struggle with that is where, where do I spend my time? You know, I'm, I'm yeah. a stay at home mom. I'm a, I'm a dad. I'm a whatever. And, um, you know, I, I still think, you know, I, I kind of side with you. If you're going to err, err on writing the next book and err on yeah. writing, not just marketing. Um, because, because I think there's a couple of things. I mean, I think one is you've mentioned it already is, you know, you need to get better at your craft and you do that by practice and practices, you know, by actually writing stuff, not marketing on AMS, you know, and, um, and, and I think once you have a little bigger catalog of stuff, then you start focusing on more of the marketing and it, as you have time. Um, but, but it's just keep writing that book. Cause there's something weird about writing when you, you, you stop. Um, and you, you stop that habit, you, you kind of do get cold. You, you get a little bit, it's harder to come back to the stories. It's harder to come back to, you know, the series when, you know, you've maybe been away for a while or a few years or even a few weeks. Um, but just keep, keep writing and keep, you know, get, getting the word, the work out there. Because I think, um, why I started this podcast was, was mainly because I really believe that the future of writing is the prolific writer in the sense of, um, if you want to be in the indie space, you have to write a lot. Um, yeah. that doesn't mean junk, but it just means you have to continually, you don't have the big five publisher behind you writing one book a year with millions of dollars of marketing behind you. And so, um, you know, you're yeah. going to win by a lot of product <laughs> and getting found that way. Um, because you're easy to find, you have a hundred stories. I mean, there, there's, you know, and you're going to have more. So, um, th there's marketing already built into that. Like, Oh, she has this. Oh, she has this. Oh, you know, she's <laughs> yeah. written all over the place, you know? 
Um, I think that's important too, because so many people write one book and then they try to market the crap out. I'm just like, please go write two more. Yeah. You're wasting your money and your time. There's nowhere to go. I mean, unless yeah. it's the best thing that's been written the last 10 years, but it's probably not. <laughs> um, yeah. so, so like you said, putting two or three out in a series, kind of getting the palette, you know, uh, the, the appetizer out there and then just keep writing more things in different series, different worlds. I think it's really yeah. good advice. Yeah, I don't even like to, I don't even like to promote the first or second book in the series, even with the catalog that I have, um, because I, I, I want to make sure that the reader, readers are so used to it now. I want to make sure that they have a few books to read through. Um, and, you know, it's also a good judge for me of whether it's, it's worth it to pursue a series. If I'm getting solid sell through, then I know, you know, in two, book two and book three, then I know, okay, I might as well keep going because I'm getting good reviews. Yes. But how many of those readers who don't review are reading through? Well, the easiest way to see that is through through sell through having something available for them. Mm-hmm. And if they jump into the rest of my stuff, if I see a jump in my other genres as well, then I realize, okay, good. I'm not I'm not just ticking those boxes for them. I'm ticking boxes, uh, storytelling boxes that they're enjoying across different genres. I've had tons of people tell me they've read my whole list and if they're reading genres they've never read before and they've found other writers in new genres too because of me because they've never read that genre. And so that's really, I love that part of it. I love connecting them with other writers yeah. as well. You know, and, and I think going back to what you said earlier about um, writing in different genres, maybe that's not the smartest you know biz, business move or mm-hmm. career move. Um, I, I think when people like a, a person's voice or just the writing ability, like they'll read all their stories. I mean, I, I'm amazed how many people don't realize that Stephen King wrote Green Mile. He wrote, yeah. he wrote Shawshank Redemption. He wrote yeah. The Body. He wrote, you know, and people are like, what? You know, the, all the great movies, the actual good movies of his, um, mm. were all non horror, non suspense. You know, and yeah. and he's just a good storyteller. Um, and so, you know, now he's doing thrillers. He's doing all kinds of stuff. And so. Um, I, I think there is some some validity to that. Obviously, people are picking up your stories and your titles and enjoying different you know genres and things. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that. So I'm always fascinated by those that have written you know hundreds of books or you know dozens and dozens of books as far as your production and your process. So um, I know you know I always I want to be careful in our show because I I don't want to bore people with just technique and all that. But yeah, but no. but I, I think there's some <laughs> some nuggets that people can learn because um, yeah. you talk about writing you know, fast and, and writing good, good drafts. Um, so talk a little bit about, are you, are you outlining out the book ahead of time, the series? Yeah. Or are you, um, you know, what does it look like once you kind of finish that first draft kind of walk us through that process? Yeah. So I am, I'm not a pantser. I've never been a pantser. I don't enjoy it. Um, I, and that comes from screenwriting and from journalism too, because you need to know, you need to know how it ends, right? If you don't know how it ends. So, um, I, I go through a lot of these, Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I go through a lot of post-it notes. I always have lots of post-it notes. If I'm doing multiple voices, I'll use multiple color post-it notes. Um, it's usually my walls are usually covered. Um, I I like the the kind of yellow page though. And I'll um, so okay. So idea comes to me or voice comes to me. I I fill in a one page, uh, which comes from screenwriting. So it's um, genre log line, which is the lead line or what the the core idea of the story is about. The breakdown of who the main characters are, who their main antagonist is, that kind of stuff. Um, I fill in the uh, first act, second act, third act with the inciting incidents that actually create. So this is just all storytelling basic stuff. So then I have kind of a rough idea of how it ends. It doesn't always end that way. I'll know by that point if it's a series. I generally write in series. I'm not usually a one-off kind of a girl. Um, For whatever reason, the voice is really chatty. So... Um, I'll go on from there and develop the idea or the concept for the series, the series arc. Uh, and if it's a trilogy, I usually know. If it's a, I had one blow up on me. It literally went from into 20 books. I'm like, okay, I'm stopping at 20. I know there's more, but that's okay. Um, and so I'll do basic plot premise um, for and timeline for each of the, the books in the series. I, it really drives me crazy when I fall in love with a series and I get to book five and they forgot she had a dog or whatever, you know what I mean? So I try to I try to flood all that stuff out. And I thanks to my editor, I keep a, an omnibus now, or a, a, sorry, a compendium of names and eye colors and all that kind of thing. My first series, I actually have some 
stuff that popped up later on. I was like, oops, that person's eye color changed. <laughs> <laughs> Their personality didn't, but you know what yeah. I mean? Um, so those are things that you, you get accustomed to as you go. So I'll start one of those documents. Um, and then I sit down and I, I start writing out all the horrible, wretched, terrible, nasty po- things I could possibly do to the character in that particular situation. Um, I will create a jigsaw puzzle on cue cards or on post-it notes. I'll assemble those together, um, shuffle them around until they form a cohesive storyline. This is all intuitive too, right? Like it's, it, it, I'm saying it like it's logical, but it's, it's a very much an intuitive process um, with logic tied into it. Cause obviously you need to, um, so I'm really grateful that I, I did take journalism and screenwriting because you have to be very logical and yet the creative side of me I have so many people say outlining isn't creative mm-hmm. it kills their creativity I'm like actually it feeds mine because without it I'm I'm hating what I'm doing so uh, yeah so then I break that down into a chapter by chapter format each chapter is usually about seven or eight um, sentences per um, my my outlines for say a seventy thousand book are usually about seventy five hundred or eight thousand words, and then I break it down day by day how many chapters I'm going to write. Or I usually go by chapter rather than by word. I don't like to stop in the middle of a chapter. Uh-huh. Um, and I sit down and six to seven days later, I have a first draft. Okay. I spend a day a day to two days depending if it's a mystery. I usually take two days to edit. I'll do a single pass, and then it goes off for editing, and I'm on the next book. Okay. So you're, okay. Writing, you're writing about 10,000 words a day. Is that yeah. ish? Tended. My 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 biggest day, and I was in a word war with someone. She challenged me, and I was like, sister. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't say it that way. But I was I was in the height of like being crazy and writing three books in a month, mm-hmm. uh, 30, 30K in one day. Oh, wow. And my, my brain was so mushy. I was sitting in the Wendy's drive through with change in my hand. Mm. Didn't know how I got there and mm-hmm. didn't know what change was and why I was looking at the, uh, it was not pretty. Yeah. So I have done that again. Um, but yeah, I can, I can reasonably do 15 a day for a week and not, not, and be fine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's important for people listening is just kind of knowing yourself knowing where the, you know, the, limited. yeah it's like that d- diminishing yeah. return you know after yeah. a certain amount you just you're not getting anything out of it you're just kind of slogging and surviving well, and, you know you're not living either right yeah. you're just you're just words on a page and that's right. that's no way to you're not enjoying what you're doing at mm-hmm. that point sure yeah so, so you said you you try to finish a chapter you know don't, not end in a chap in the middle of a chapter do you have kind of an idea of how many words per chapter or is that just book specific or what's no, like what's like your comfort zone i'm i'm typically between 1500 and 2500 words per chapter that's i don't know why mm-hmm. that's just where my my voices land me mm-hmm. um and my books are generally between um depends on the genre and the age group but generally between 50 and 95,000 words. Okay. Yeah. And then you, you've written, um, you know, full length novels, novellas, short stories. Um, is there, uh, you know, for you, uh, authors always say different things. Do you, do you enjoy one length over another or one, um, you know, short versus long or what do you prefer? I'm a novel writer. I have 71 novels done. Um, and I have, I have 15 short stories published and I, I, there's probably 10 of those. No. Yeah. Probably 10 of those that want to be full length books with series mm-hmm. on the other end. They just happened to be, they were for anthologies or they were, um, I had one wake me up in the middle of the night. It was a literally an entire from start to finish. And I sat down that day, it was nine K and I wrote it mm-hmm. and, um, I just published it recently. Actually, I got it back from an anthology, and I love it so much. It's just one of those really inspired that I didn't have to outline it. It had it unwound in the dream from start to finish. It was mm-hmm. fantastic. That's great. So, 
Yeah, I love it when that, that muse hits. But I'm, yeah, I'm a novel writer. I love writing books. I love the long form. I love the series. I love working mm-hmm. with the characters so long that you're in their skin or they're in your skin. and you. Mm-hmm. But they're still telling you stuff like, no, I don't like bananas. I'm allergic to those. You're what? Four, four books in? You're allergic to bananas? Mm-hmm. You know, it's that discovery of mm-hmm. uh, who they are. Like you're sitting across from them having a cup of coffee and mm-hmm. they're your best friend, but you didn't know anything. You know, you didn't know that about them. So, right. yeah. Yeah, you know, a lot of young writers, they, they, they're they scared of the novel a little bit. You know, well, I'm going to write short stories and that. But, but there's something about, I think novels are more gracious. Um, you can kind of, you know, explore more territory and stumble around. And, you know, I just had a guy on here who's saying, he's like, yeah, you know, some chapters aren't that great. But, you know, it's that's part of a novel. Like, I mean. I so disagree. I yeah. so disagree. <laughs> okay. Short stories are, there's. Short stories are, yes, you have to be more succinct. I challenged myself once. Um, one of my main editors, Amanda mm-hmm. Redkin, uh, is a flash fiction goddess. She's mm-hmm. like, right. she can write the most amazing stuff in under a thousand words. I can't even. It just blows my mind. Mm-hmm. And so I challenged myself to do it, and I loved it, and it was really fun. But no, mm-hmm. that actually is a series. <laughs> yeah. One piece of flash I wrote is just, it's like a multiple book series. Mm-hmm. Um, you You can't, you can't. You can't go. I I can't. I'm not going to say you. I can't go in with that attitude. Every single chapter, Mm -hmm. every interaction, everything. I've been accused of being um, too action packed because Mm -hmm. my chapters are. I fling, or I don't. They do it to themselves. They Mm -hmm. fling themselves from one disaster to the next. And so there's. I feel like I have this responsibility to make sure their story is told properly. Mm -hmm. And so I don't. There are no throwaway chapters in Mm -hmm. my books. In fact, so this is one thing about me. I'm a very spare writer, um, and um, there's times when I'll have to go in and flesh stuff out a little bit more because mm-hmm. when I write, um, I'm so focused on what's happening that I want to make sure that the reader lives it and is in it, mm-hmm. but to the point where sometimes I'll skip over some details and stuff, so I'll have to go. That's what my edit pass is for, to go in and make sure I've fleshed all that out. Um, I... I I, I don't believe in padding anything or in in chapters that are just there because they're there. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, no, I totally disagree. Yeah. I think yeah. every word, and but not that every word counts. But yeah, every, no, no, yeah, yeah, no. I I totally agree. I think it's just with short stories, you have to you jump right into the middle of the thing, and it's yeah, got to it's sure. got to be super tight, and you know, there's yeah. no room to play at all. You know, yeah. no details, no, you know. But, I, I but you're, right. you're right. You're right. Need to be. They need to be. You have to carry that reader from from yep. the inciting incident to the end and keep them, you know, like yeah. yeah. Anyway, <laughs> well, no, and I I think one of my flaws in my some of my stories is is they're so action packed that you don't feel like do I even know the people? <laughs> you know, it's like they're always just yeah. they're they're doing yeah. something and they're you yeah. know, and I write some thrillers too, so they're like always you know, can you slow down just a little, you know, but. Take uh, a breath. So, so let's, let's dig. So, okay. You, you, you talked about, you know, outlining series book, um, you crank out 10,000 words a day. Um, and then, you know, once you get ready for editor, who who are you sending it to? And then kind of what's the process once you send it away and get it back and, and production after that, what's kind of the, the production process? Right. So I have a main content editor, as I mentioned, and editor Redkin, she's pretty amazing. Um, we've done 70, Five books together, I think. Mm. 70 or 75 projects together. Um, so uh, there's the the big overview. So she's there to make sure that everything's cohesive, that um, uh, I haven't dropped any threads, um, that it fits the timeline of the the other books in the series. Um, and she does a little bit of copy editing at the same time. She can't help herself. And so she sends it back to me. I do a pass. It goes back to her. She does a pass. And then we're generally done. It's we're we're pretty quick. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it goes to copy edits, um, and uh, yeah, comes back to me. I'll I'll accept or not accept anything that she might send to me. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a great copy editor too, um, who understands my voice. Um, I. I write a lot of choppy sentences. I do a lot of first person, so it's really personal and really interpersonal, really emotional, whatever. Um, 
and then uh, I do those those two will also do proofing as they go and then I do m the most boring job on the planet which is I sit and listen to my book being read to me by a computer mm. <laughs> try to get as much of the typos and stuff as possible uh -huh. and then away she goes she's off to she's off to live and I'm on to the next book okay yeah. So what's what's your monthly? I mean, are you doing like a book a month? Are you doing multiple books a month? How how? Just depends on the month. I took this last month to update all my marketing, all my keywords, and all that stuff. But typically, um, this has been a busy year. I think I did. I think I put out six books since the middle of January. I think. Um, so the the next this probably the next three months. I'm looking at. Um, I'm hoping for two books a month. I'd like to, I'd like to take a little time off this summer, but it probably, probably not gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> I really want to. I have this cozy mystery series. I'm on book three, and then there's thirteen. I want to finish it by the end of the year. So, um, I'm hoping to get the next three done this summer, plus a couple of other projects. That, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, great. Uh, so, as we get close to an hour here, I wanna I wanna be sensitive to our time and your time as well. Um, sure is I always like to ask kind of advice for the aspiring prolific writer is, you know, you've written these stories, you've been through a lot, you've walked away from writing for a while, come back. Um, and, you know, you obviously love telling stories and it doesn't seem like that's going to slow down. But, but what would you just tell someone that's kind of listening to your, your experiences? Um, you know, maybe even that, that part of, you know, hey, I was – I thought I should write, and then I stopped, and but I knew I had to. Um, but what are some things you've kind of learned along the way that you think could help some people as, as they're listening? Uh, try different forms of writing. So uh, don't just get stuck in in genre fiction if that's what your thing is. Um, try write your if you if you're having trouble write your thing out as a screenplay. There's tons of different um, models of screenplay writing out there. Uh, you want to tighten up your dialogue. You write a screenplay because it's so much white space and it's like ninety percent dialogue, <laughs> right? Um, right. Uh, and you know, write some nonfiction. Um, dabble in a genre you've never written before. Um, but I think. The most important thing is to, to, when you're working on a project, finish the project. Hmm. Uh, it's so easy to get distracted by the new shiny. And the new shiny shows up for me all the time. I have, I think it's, at last count, it was about 250 projects waiting to be written. <laughs> and so I'll fill out a one page, and I'll file the one page away, and I'll finish the project. And then I move on to the next project, and then I move on to the next project. Um, I, I, yeah, if, if you don't finish what you started, you can't move on to the next thing. You can't. You're not mentally in the next thing. You're, you're lingering yeah. energetically. You're lingering with that last thing. So finish a product, even if it's to the point where you realize that you don't want to publish it, uh -huh. mark it finished and put it away and move on to the next one. Uh -huh. You can't. I don't think you can be prolific with stuff hanging off you. Yeah. You need to be willing to let it go and move forward. Yeah, there, I think there's there's people probably listening that have, you know, 10, 12, 15 projects that are unfinished that even if they went back and kind of <laughs> tried to maybe either tweak or start over on some of these, they could have, you know, 10 things out before long. And I, that was my story. I mean, that's partly why I started this podcast was I had all these things hanging, nothing finished. And then, you know, stupid NaNoWriMo came along and grab me, grab me and yeah. I, I said you know here here's something that's going to force me to finish something and um and it, it's something about you know i and I, you're not the only one that said this and i find it interesting is that once you finish it's like this dam kind of breaks mm -hmm. and you just kind of tell yourself i i can do this and it may be junky and crappy and no one's going to read it but usually it's the first one is but 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 it's you just kind of tell yourself wow i i did it like i can do it again yeah. you know and it's going to be better the next time i know it will um, cause you learn so much just going through the process. I think that's kind of the key. Um, and you're probably learning a million things every book you do. I mean, oh, I totally, yeah. every book I write, I mean, my edit, my outlining process is constantly changing, mm -hmm. uh, and evolving. Going into writing mysteries was entirely different. I had to restructure how I was going to outline and I had so much fun doing it. I'm still having so much mm -hmm. fun doing it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, I think learning is half 
the joy of mm-hmm. what it is you do, right? right? Learning what how you are as a writer, um, how your voice evolves. Sometimes I feel like I'm letting down the voices because my writing skills are at this level and they're up here. Mm-hmm. And so it's trying to catch up with those that, oh, sorry, somebody woke up. Mm-hmm. Trying to catch up with uh, those, those voices that, you know, to tell their story in a way that does them justice with the skills that I have. So I'm always, yeah, I want to learn more. I want to do more. I want to write in a different way. I, you know, I don't want to fall into mm-hmm. um, writing one particular kind of story. And I think that's why I cross genres too. Cause mm-hmm. I, I, I just love exploring how to be a better writer, mm-hmm. how to be a better storyteller. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's great. That's great. So Patty, uh, tell us uh, what you're working on right now. I mean, there's probably 50 things, but, um, <laughs> and, and then, and then also where people can find you in your work. Right. Um, so right now, um, I just finished outlining a novella that I owe to an anthology. And then I'm um, off to Banff on Saturday for the World Media uh, Festival. My creative partner and I were invited to go uh, present our web series, which is really exciting. It's the biggest event in the world of its kind. Very cool. When I get home, <laughs> when I get home, I have three cozy murder mysteries to write before the 1st of August. Um and yeah, and then a whole bunch more before I see, you know, you know, it's more and more and more. Right. Uh, and so you can find me at www.pattylarson.com. You can email me at patty at pattylarson.com. That's patty with an I and Larson with me. Uh, and on Facebook, it, you can always find me on Facebook. I'm constantly checking Facebook. Uh, it's uh, facebook.com slash patty Larson author. Great. Yeah, that's it. Well, great. I will put all that in the show notes too, and people can find you and go check out uh, one of her books. Uh, there's many to choose from. And so, so Patty, this has been a, a great joy. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you for being flexible when I screwed up the schedule. And, oh, no. and um, I love just hearing your story and your passion, and you're going to help a lot of people from this interview. So thanks for coming on. Well, thank you so much for having me, and thank you for doing this podcast. It's re- I think it's really important for people to, to know that being prolific is – it's a blessing mm. it's really a blessing but also it's okay if you're not right. but if you are don't feel like there's something wrong with you because there really isn't right good yeah. good words to end on I, well thanks yeah. patty we'll we'll keep in Thank touch you. okay